All right. Hey, we have an amazing guy on the podcast today. Uh, he has created Recovery Elevator Podcast. And this is where I met Paul Churchill. Listen to him. Countless episodes. Amazing podcast. We're going to dive deep into this. Created a community called Cafe RE. For those, a community for those who wish to quit drinking. Alcoholism is a disease. It is ruining lives. And we're going to dive deep into this. He wrote a book, Alcohol is Shit. It is an amazing book. I haven't read it yet. I've, I've clipped it. I'm, it's another book I need to get. But the podcast, I've listened to many, many episodes. He also ha was on a TED Talk 2017. And we're going to dive deep into his story. And you will be amazed. You want to listen to every second of this. Paul, welcome aboard. Hey, Aaron. Thanks for having me. It's good to, good to see you again. I love this, and I love this uh, being on this end of it, and I'll tell them in just a minute. But tell, tell the listeners a little bit about yourself. Married kids, I know you have a dog. Um, what do you like to do for fun? What gets you up in the morning? Yeah, yeah, great questions, Aaron. So my name's Paul Churchill. Currently, I'm living in Edwards, Colorado. I've been doing recovery elevator on the road since November. So I went to Australia, went to Thailand, New Zealand, Mexico, Oaxaca, Mexico. I'm kind of looking for a new home base. Wow. So uh, I was in Bozeman, Montana for the last 10 years. That's an incredible place. Uh, I'm single. And, but at this moment, I am exploring um, changing that status. Um, and I've got a wonderful standard poodle named Ben. He's a monster. He's like 75 pounds. And <laughs> what gets me up in the morning is getting outside when the sun comes up, getting out in nature. I just got a new mountain bike. Um, and uh, I love being outside. I, I think watching a sunset and sunrise is um, uh, uh, coupled with some other tools is really all a person needs to depart from an addiction from alcohol. And we'll cover, we'll cover more on that in, in, in a bit, I imagine. Yes. And, and folks, if you haven't listened to recovery elevator, make sure when we're done here, you load up the app, you get the podcast and start listening. Um, I was actually interviewed by Paul episode 264 it's called broken and whole this was back in just march this year um i've been alcohol free for i think it's about 214 days and i remember your podcast led to me getting to that point to say you know what i just don't want to drink anymore but i realized i had a problem and we're going to dive into this we're going to i want them to hear your story um you know why why and we'll get there but why is this a problem so let's hear your story if you can summarize this you have an amazing story i've heard it a, a ton but let's share with the listeners yeah thanks Aaron. and real quick i just want to comment fantastic job i think you said 214 days i'm looking at my sheet right now and we when we chatted you had 128 days mm -hmm. uh, and i also look back on our emails and i think in november you said i'm looking to start a podcast so you've got some goals on the horizon starting back from november that you followed through you've taken the action to 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 realize to make it happen so i just want to say great job on that because the departure from an addiction and creating a podcast all of it requires action and you're a guy of action and here we are chatting today so so thanks for having me Thank you. um okay a little about a little bit about my story so the the whole concept of the story too in departing from an addiction is an interesting one because eventually there comes a time in your story, Aaron, and you're maybe you've already encountered this or you're going to butt up against this, but there comes a time, Aaron, where you got to say goodbye to your story. And I love sharing my story. However, I, I share it in a way to empower others. And I also share it in a way where I'm moving energy internally, mm -hmm. where I start to break off the, 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 the past of the, you know, the uncomfortable reasons why I drank in childhood. So I, I share my story to empower others to move energy. But what I realized there was a pickle that I was doing was I was almost reinforcing my story while I was doing the podcast, like a hundred mm -hmm. episodes in there. And I was like, uh Oh, I'm also, I'm, I'm like reinforcing my story, the, the mm -hmm. depression, the anxiety. And what I realized is there was comfort in being depressed, being anxious. Um, there was comfort in being hung over. There was comfort in being addicted to a substance. And I know that sounds strange, but the hardest part about departing from an addiction is stepping away from you, stepping away from your story. And there's a phrase that they say in the, 
the rooms of the 12 steps is you don't have to change much. You just have to change everything. And the first time I heard that, Aaron, I'm like, whoa, that's intense. And I, I, I agree with that. But what mostly I, re- I agree that refers to is you have to change your thinking. So let's back it up a little bit. Aaron, I was a normal drinker for about seven years from age 15 to 22. And then I studied abroad in Spain at age 21. Um, I came back after that studying abroad. I fell in love with a Dutch girl. And I came back and at age 21, Aaron, I had a rough summer. I had to say goodbye to my first love. I was in a band. I played guitar. I was in a rock band. And we, we was a really good band. We were playing a bunch of clubs in Hollywood, doing little mini tours. And I thought I was going to be a rock star for the rest of my life, Aaron. So the band breaks up. I break up with my girlfriend um, and then I lose my best friend that summer, which was alcohol. Mm -hmm. So alcohol before was, was just a tool, a device to enhance an evening, but I could take it or leave it. But that summer I relied heavily on alcohol to help get me past the, the girl and the departure of the girl and the breakup of the band. Um, I didn't know it at the time, but alcohol was slowly deepening its grips and becoming a coping mechanism, a coping strategy. Now, I can't beat myself up with this, and I, I'd, I'd encourage listeners to, 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 to realize that I, alcohol helped me. It did. It, it helped me get through these extremely lonely and difficult times. And it's what I had to do to cope. So for me to get to my sobriety date and be like, oh, you idiot, Paul, like why, how could you possibly have become addicted to alcohol? Well, number one, there's millions and millions of people across the globe in America alone who do the same. And number two, it's how I survived. It's, it's what I got, what, what, how, I, how I made it, right? So I was resourceful in that capacity. Um, but, those, but those coping strategies were no longer sustainable in the long run. Okay, so I actually ended up going back to Spain, Aaron, uh, from ages 24 to 27. I bought a bar in Granada, Spain. I went back to the, the spot where I studied abroad. I had such a good time partying out there. Loved the Spanish language. I went out there, um, and I bought half of a bar. And it was the best and the worst time of my life, Aaron. As you can imagine, the best part was I was 24 to 27, mid-20s, owning a bar in the country that I would say has the most intense nightlife on the planet. And, uh, you know, tapas, uh, great food. On the weekends, I'd rent cars and drive to uh, Barcelona, to France. I would just travel all around. It was, it was incredible. On the flip side of that, Aaron, <laughs> I was becoming addicted to alcohol. And it was extremely lonely. I was so far away from friends and family. And there became a time at the end, Aaron, where I would wake up at probably 5.58 a.m. The unconscious would wake me up. And I would walk downstairs. At 6.01, I'd be downstairs for the convenience store across the street that would open. And I would get a box of wine and two beers. And I would come back to my apartment. Um, and I would, chug, I would chug the wine. I would microwave two beers so I could drink them faster. So they weren't as cold. And I'd go back to bed and I did this ridiculous dance all before 6, 10 AM hmm. for like a year. And if you were to ask me at that time, Aaron, Hey Paul, do you think you have a drinking problem? You just drank like six to eight drinks before 7 AM or 6, 15 AM. I'd be like, nah, this is what everybody does in their mid twenties. So you can almost see another insidious part that alcohol can play. It completely warps your thinking. So after that, Aaron, I recognized um, I did that, that something needed to change. And, and, I, and I, I did something smart. I took off the pride and ego hat and I walked away from the bar. I just walked away. I was physically dying. In fact, there was a, there was a night and a blackout. I was blacking out like five to seven nights per week. And there was a night wow. where I took uh, four Ambien's. Those are those are pretty heavy sleeping pills. And I, I was passed out for like two days. And, and there's a lot of people who have, who've died that way. Their, their respiratory system just stops. Um, and I walked away from Spain and I did the geographical cure, assuming that the drinking habits would have stayed on that side of the Atlantic. And it did in some regard, but um, most of it came with me. And then mid 20s or late 20s, I say, drinking can't be the problem. I'm going to grad school. So I go to UW. Um, and, and, the, and then my internship took me to Bozeman, Montana. And in 2010, Aaron, um, I'm starting to see things clear. I'm starting to say that, okay, alcohol, this, these hangovers are killing me, right? I'm so sick of drinking my roommate's Jack Daniels and then going to the liquor store the next day and buying it again and replacing it. I mean, I did that 50, 100 times with my parents when I stayed with my parents in my mid-20s. 
um, it, I just kept doing it. And I was, I was able to, to put the pieces together. The writing was on the wall, the moderation techniques that I had tried, none of that stuff was working. So the idea of quitting was, was surfacing. So in 2010, on January 1st, I decided to go one month away from alcohol and I did it. It was difficult, but I did it. And I said, you know what? I'm, I'm, I'm feeling really good right now. So that one month turned into two. I said, damn, I'm feeling even better. Uh, that two month turned into two and a half years. And what happened after that, Aaron, looking back, I was staying away from alcohol, viewing it as a sacrifice. I was avoiding a substance. Um, so internally that created a divide. There was almost a fracture that was happening, a splintering internally that I was going through life, um, staying away from a substance. And then in 2012, um, I, 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 I was going forward on willpower and that willpower muscle, which is finite and exhaustible, it gave up. I went to an AA meeting in support of a friend, not even for me. It was my first AA meeting, Aaron. And I heard a stories around that room of divorce, bankruptcy, prison, jail, job loss, all this stuff, multiple DUIs. And I walked out, Aaron, and I said, woohoo, there's no way I can have a drinking problem because none of that stuff has happened to me keyword yet. Uh, and so I drank two days later, I drank all the alcohol in the house, woke up, was like, holy shit. Oh, and in fact, the night before, this is after being away from alcohol for two and a half years, I found myself at 2.30 in the morning after the bars had closed, Googling if I could drink rubbing alcohol or hydrogen peroxide. So <laughs> right there, I woke up the next day, I was like, oh shit, we, uh, we might have been onto something with that no drinking thing. So I got another four months, I drank and then I got 10 months and I drank and then I got three months and then I got two months. Then I got one month. Then I got a week. Then I got four days. Then I got three days. Then I went, Oh shit. I don't know if I'm ever going to be able to get back on that again. And then summer of 2014, Aaron got pretty grim. I had a failed suicide attempt. Um, I, I experienced emotional depths that I didn't even know was possible for a human to experience. It was the worst summer of my life. However, without those pain points, I don't move forward in life without alcohol. Unfortunately, that's how human beings have decided to learn best is with those uncomfortable pain drivers. And, and on September 7, 2014, uh, I, I took my last drink. You know, you dropped a lot of information that just ha probably has people just sitting here going, wow, unbelievable. And, and there's different levels. And when I, when I came across your podcast and the reason I did and, and and listeners, I, I pray that you're listening with an open ear and open heart is I never drank like an alcoholic because I didn't consider myself an alcoholic, but I was drinking enough, you know, a few beers here, sometimes two beers in a night or three beers would give me a horrendous headache. I would wake up at four in the morning. I, I Sometimes I, I was puking. After just a few beers, I'm like, what is happening to me? So I thought, I want to stop this. And I saw this affecting my family. I saw this affecting me and my health. And that's what this show is about. How do we get healthy? And you think, alcohol, really? Well, alcohol, you know, when we as a chiropractor, I'm always help, trying to help people. You got to eat better, better nutrition, better exercise, better sleep, better lifestyle choices. Well, alcohol is the same thing. And when I came across your podcast and I started listening to this, Paul, I heard these crazy stories like yours. And I thought, well, that's not me. I'm not an alcoholic. But then I, I started listening more and more and I, I couldn't stop listening. And I, I, what resonated with me is I have a drinking problem. And I, I looked at it as maybe different levels. I didn't know at the time, but I'm like, the drinking problem that I have Maybe not, it may not be your problem, but it's mine and it's affecting my life and it's affecting my health. So I, I said at one point, I don't know where this was, I've, I've got to stop drinking. And when you say that, when you declare that, things start to happen <laughs> and, uh, and your life starts to change and you say you start to go in turmoil. It's a good turmoil because you're going to beat it. And uh, then one day, I think it was October 6th um, last year, I just said, I'm done. And I had prepped myself with hundreds of episodes of yours. I would just sit and listen and listen and listen and listen. And the first week or two, I just, I listened to work, after work, <laughs> in the morning, working out. Oh, I listened to your podcast. I didn't have any other resource. You didn't have the book out yet. I just listened to your podcast. Um, 
So when we look at, at this, I mean, this, this was destructive on your health. You almost lost your life, probably more than once, but you almost lost your life. You talk about affecting your health. What, from your standpoint, from your viewpoint, I mean, you've interviewed hundreds and hundreds of people and you, you've, you're really a knowledge base in this. Where, is, where are these problems? Well, how does this affect us? I mean, we can, you can dive into this chemically, physically, emotionally, spiritually, affects it all, but where do you think these problems are, are, are how they're affecting us health-wise? Sure, I think the biggest one, which eventually le leads to physical degradation in the body is an emotional disconnection. So an emotional disconnection, A, with yourself. So if you have a uh, disconnection internally, even at the cellular level, that's going to be represented on the, in your external environment. So what I've learned doing Recovery Elevator is your inner and external environment are mirrored. So if there's lack internally, you're going to see the lack externally. So the opposite of addiction is connection. And then when we become addicted to alcohol, we become disconnected. We first become distant, disconnected with ourselves spiritually mm -hmm. and mentally. And externally, then our connections with our good friends, our spouse, our family members, our neighbors, even our pets, even nature begins to, to take a back seat, begins to soften, right? And once that happens, once we're further disconnected from our communities, from our ties, from our relationships, from our college friends, all that stuff, then the physical the physical breakdown starts to happen. The body, we, we almost find ourselves in, in more episodes of fight or flight. And then when we're in, a, we're in the fight or flight response, your body is saying, look, this isn't a time to heal. This isn't a time to properly digest our food. This isn't a time to casually circulate blood throughout the body. This sure as hell isn't a time to meet friends. This is a time to address the perceived threat in the external environment which isn't there, but we've, if we perceive it the external environment because there's a threat in the internal environment, which is a cellular disconnection, right? We're becoming disconnected from source, disconnected from spirit, disconnected from yourself, disconnected from your friends, family, spouse, and loved one. Um, and, and there's a, a myriad more of scientific uh, you know, things where the body breaks down and the liver, pancreas, and things like that in the brain, but most it, it, most of it can be summarized with just a disconnection and overall discontent. There's a, there's like a background hum of unhappiness that's going on at all time. And, and usually you're not aware of it. Wow. You know, and I, I never looked at it that way. We talk a lot about fight and flight in our office. Patients are always under stress and that can be chemical stress. And this is a chemical folks. This is a chemical. This isn't, I see Paul drinking his big jug of water. Water is, is a, as I call it a chemical H2O. It's a, it's healthy for us, but alcohol is a chemical. And any, anytime we're in fight and flight, our body, like you said, can't digest. It can't think properly. It can't remember things in. So you're saying the alcohol itself, as we continue drinking, and and maybe you can you can hit on this is how much how much is that how much does it take to be in that state for our body to be disconnected that we are living in this fight and flight because many people don't know it does it take just a couple beers a night I mean where are these habits um, developing in our society and how bad does it look or how bad does it have to look sure. And um, this might sound surprising for me to say this, but I think a couple drinks a night or a, a drink a night is okay. And there are no health benefits to this. Uh, believe me, I've done so much research with it. I think it's okay. And if you're, if you're believing that wine is good for your cardiovascular health, well, it's the polyphenols and the grape skin, right? Just drink grape juice, right? <laughs> so, um, but I do feel if, you, if you're a normal drinker, drink one for me and have one to two a night and, and, and that's fine where it gets insidious is, is stress is probably the biggest killer in our environment right now. And you see this in your office all the time. So stress throws so many systems out of line and out of whack and in alcohol repeated use over and over. So I was using alcohol to, to cover up past traumas, cover up loneliness while being in Spain, loneliness from the, uh, from childhood. Um, then 
those create the environments that are stressful. That's, that's being hung over. And then your work performance, then you got spouses, you got people saying, Hey, I think you got a drinking problem. Then that stress, which is created by the, the alcohol, the chemical alcohol, um, it's almost kills you twofold, right? So the chemical alcohol in copious amounts, you can, anybody can test this. Don't recommend it. It's, it's alcohol poison. You can die. If you drink enough of it, it's, it's, it's a poison. It's a toxin. It, alcohol is really good at fueling things. It's flammable. It'll make your car go really fast down the freeway. It's great for that. But ingesting a lot of it into your body, it will wreck your body over time. Let me ask you this is, are there different uh, genetic traits that cause people to, if they were to drink one or two beers or a glass of wine or drinks a night, that would drive them down that road? Are, are there things that, that we need to be aware of? My, I lost my, my older brother this year, January 1st, and he was an alcoholic. And it didn't just it didn't just affect his liver, it affected everything. And we couldn't, and we're gonna talk in a minute about some solutions we can go through, but are there traits that we need to be aware of um, that maybe we're not even thinking about? Yeah, that's right, I forgot about your brother on January 1st and you made it through mm -hmm. without a drink. I recall this, Yeah, fantastic stuff. And I'm sorry again to, to hear about your brother. So scientists have yet to discover the addiction gene and I don't feel they will because it doesn't exist. And where my journey has taken me in my first 100 episodes, I would call it a disease, your genetic markers, your genetic predisposition. Well, I have since changed my tune with the more research I've done, the more people that I've chatted with, and also my personal experience. And some of this can be tested with addiction whack-a-mole. And that is when we remove our alcohol, remove alcohol or coping mechanism, but we haven't addressed the source of the pain, then it's only a matter of time before we replace alcohol with exercise or work or with gambling, or with cigarettes, or with gummy bears, or with uncomfortable thoughts, or just a, a new thought pattern. And, and then you're not going to say like, oh, well, you have the alcohol addiction gene, and you have the, the gummy worm gene, right? It's, <laughs> there's not a gene that says, oh, now you have the gambling, now you have the Amazon, Amazon Prime shopping gene. You don't, <laughs> right? You're simply, you're, you're, you're simply replacing the coping mechanism with another strategy. Um, what I do feel there are genetic tendencies with, I call this enhanced dopamine receptors. And there is some science out there with this is we don't, not everybody's dopamine reward system in their brain is wired the same. So some of us experience pleasure and pain differently. Some people are going to experience the heat of a fire different. And this is an evolutionary trait that for us worked well, but almost it's like backfiring in these days where in the past, some people would walk just a little bit further to find food, to find uh, you know, we're like ice age stuff. We'd, we cross another Bering Strait to find a mate or to find food or to find warmth where other people who don't experience joy the same perhaps wouldn't. And I recall my first drink was similar to a lot of the people that I've interviewed. We feel the sensation of, whoa, that's what I've been missing. Mm -hmm. Where a lot of normal drinkers, they take that first drink and they're like, whoa, this tastes like shit. <laughs> yeah. It's, it's funny. I'm glad you clarified that because I think a lot of people out there think, um, it's just genetic. I can't break this. And it's just, I'm stuck with this. And it's interesting when I would, it, it, it probably in my forties, I started realizing, you know what, maybe I don't need this. Maybe I shouldn't have this, but I didn't want to do anything about it because I felt like maybe it was some coping or something. I don't know. I felt like I was going to lose something, lose some fun, lose some excitement, lose the, I was always the, the energetic party guy. You know, I was going to lose that. And I didn't want to lose something, but I got to a point that I, I would have a beer and as soon as I would get that beer taste, I'm like, I want another one. And I, and about three or four and I, I could cut it off there. My wife and other people I'd hang around with, they'd have a half a glass of wine and let it sit there. And I would look and think, you're going to waste that. <laughs> like, that's crazy. And I thought maybe there's some kind of genetic change, genetic, you know, and I was looking into that and I think I was listening to, you know, your podcast at the time. And then I realized, you know what? It's just a behavior trait. It's just a, a I'm a compulsive guy. I'm an, uh, I like when I do something, like when I started running, I wanted to start running. I went for a marathon. You go all out. And I thought, hmm, this may be part of that. I just have to shift it to something healthy. And I can honestly tell you, once I got past that, it was, it was first a mindset. One, I knew I, I, it was a problem. It was affecting me. Unless we see that, we don't change. 
And two, I decided I, I want to change not only for me, but for my family. And once I got past those first couple of weeks, I, I haven't really, I, you know, I, I've craved a beer once in a while, I'll see a beer and think, wow, that used to taste good. But I haven't had any desire to, to uh, act on that. And I just, I thank you every day. Um, you may not hear this, but I do because it was your podcast that kind of pushed me to that. And I, I remember praying about this saying, Lord, please help me with this. And I think I know he led me to your podcast and, and found this. Can you just hit on a little bit before we get into some solutions? The, like, what is happening in our society? Is society making this more, um, more easy to, to be in like drinking clubs. I remember one of the episodes, a, a woman said, you know, she, it was like a women's wine thing. And she was, everyone was drinking wine, women with wine. And they were drinking it like after their kids got on the bus and they would have a coffee cup while the kids got on the bus. So if their neighbors saw them, it looked like they were having coffee, but it was becoming kind of a movement. Is this, is, is some of that actually happening? Well, you teed that one up pretty good. We can go real spiritual with that too. And uh, all right. So culturally right now, we are in a wobble across the whole globe and rates of anxiety, depression uh, are, are unprecedented rates. People are struggling with addiction. They're the highest record, highest, highest than ever, right? And unfortunately, I think it's going to rise, raise more before it goes down. And there's a concept, we are all, we're all familiar with the stigma surrounding drugs and alcohol. And it's unfortunately, I think the stigma is more dangerous than drugs and alcohol. Is, let's call it the drugs, alcohol is a drug. The stigma is more dangerous than drugs itself because it forces many of us to reach our most acute moments of pain before reaching out for help. And for some people, it's too far. It's, they're, they're dead, right? Um, and what I've come to realize is that we create the stigma almost those who are in addiction and the stigma outside of us is not real. I mean, I could walk outside right now and tell 50 strangers about recovery elevator, about drinking. And I'm going to get 55, five, 50 high fives and hugs. I, I don't think that's an exaggeration, maybe 49 out of 50. And that one person who doesn't give me the high five, they've got a drinking problem and they're, 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 um, their interjections are because they don't want to quit drinking. So the stigma, it's almost like you said earlier, you didn't want to give it up. You felt like you were giving up your friend. There was part of you that just was mm -hmm. like, I want to quit, but I don't. And there's this big fracture. There's this divide that's happening internally where we want to, we want to be the best version of ourselves but also we don't want to give up alcohol. It's like, you can't have both. And where this journey without alcohol takes you, it's internal. And I believe the heart and soul know this. So when I mean internal, that means you're no longer attaching your happiness, your, your identity, your, your well being to your external roles and your external validation. So this is your house. This is your job. This is your, Hey, I'm a mom. I'm a dad. I'm a son you're going internal. And part of you knows that. And part of you almost puts up this fight, puts up this barrier to why you can't drinking. I mean, just question the air and the amount of excuses you told yourself, the amount of excuses I told myself. At the end of the day, there's a large part of me that even though I knew I, 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 I couldn't keep drinking, that I was going to die unconsciously, there was a big part of me that didn't want to quit drinking. And I get these emails all the time, Aaron, I'll get this, this huge paragraph of all the damage that alcohol has done in their lives, like <laughs> all the stuff I mentioned earlier, right? It's destroying their lives. Mm. And then the second paragraph, they're, they're like, I don't know what to do. I want to quit drinking so bad. And the second paragraph goes, but I don't, but AA is not for me. And they've never been to an AA meeting. How the hell do they know that? But yeah. I can't tell my mom. I can't tell my spouse. I can't tell my job. I can't tell my book club. I can't tell my, my, my mommy wine club. So even in the email, I can see the fracture internally. I can see the split. And earlier we said the inner environment is mirrored in the external environment. I can see they're putting it out. They want to quit, but unconsciously they don't want to quit. And then what happens though, when we do quit, we're working with energies here. There's more energy around moving forward in life without alcohol than the energy of the addiction. And that's what I call the tipping point. You know, when I decided to, to stop and it was that first week, second week, third week, fourth week, I started to realize and I'm always talking health in my office. That's my life. That's what my occupation. That's me 100%. 
and there's a, a small divide there that I'm actually doing something that's harming me. And it, and that's where the alco- the word alcoholic just didn't resonate. I'm like, I am not that bad. It's like saying I'm, you're obese. I'm like, I'm not obese, but I have an eating problem. <laughs> you know, and I, I had a problem that was affecting me. And I, I began to realize I didn't have a headache ever again. I didn't wake up feeling like crap. And that was sometimes after just two beers. And I was so thankful. I thought, wow, I just took my health to another level. Um, you, you, you should, and folks, if, if you, if this is even resonating with you just a, just a bit, I urge you, please go to Recovery Elevator, get on the podcast and just start listening. I went back, I don't, I, I don't know if I listened to every episode, but I was running out. I couldn't, you, I was, I was going too fast for you because you only put out one a week. So I had to go back and go back and go back. I remember going back all the way to number one. I'm like, I, I need these like seven days a week, if not more but it was feeding me. Um, go back and listen and listen to these stories. You'll listen to some and say, wow, that's not me. I don't have a problem. It's a health problem. That's what the show is about health issues, but you'll hit one or two and it will stop you in your tracks and you'll say, ah, that's me. And I remember hearing that with a couple guests saying, oh, that's me. That's exactly how I feel. So I would tell my wife, I'd say, hun, I, when I drink, I, I want to drink five. And she's like, you're just crazy. <laughs> she goes, why do you think that way? I said, I don't know, but other people think this way. I'm not crazy. But it's, 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 a, it's a problem with me. And she just would look at me, didn't, wouldn't understand. So if this resonates with you, you may have a small problem. And we all are addicted to something. And whether it's poor eating habits, a lack of exercise, um, just lifestyle. But I mean, this this goes across the board. This affects family. This affects your relationship with your kids. This affects, I'm sure, we don't have to really dive into this, get into these episodes, but divorce and separation, I'm sure this is tied in greatly. So let's let's dive into solutions. They're sitting there listening going, huh, maybe this is me. What do I, where do I need to go? And I gave them one, go to the podcast. That, that was the thing that just, just transformed my life. What are your, your solutions? What do you, what's your advice on this? Aaron, there's, there's so many solutions or so many tools and now is the best time to quit drinking than ever due to the resources available. Still there's, there's, there's AA 12 step refuge recovery. There's smart meetings, all that stuff. However, um, the very best way to depart from an addiction is to burn the ships. And that's an analogy that, I didn't invent the word burn the ships. That's with Hernan Cortez when he, when he sailed to Veracruz and took over the Aztecs in 1519. But uh, what I mean by burning the ships, the power of that is earlier as we, we spoke, you're, you're moving the energy internally when you start to talk about it. But number two, you create accountability and you can't unburn the ships once you do it. You can't unhave those conversations. And as I said earlier, the stigma is false. Your, your, your reactions you're going to get, they're going to surprise you. They're going to be unconditional love and support. And occasionally you might get pushed back, but usually those people are also questioning their own drinking. And then on the rare, I'm talking rare, out of thousands of stories that I've heard, the rare experience when someone's just deletes you from your life, well, that's a good thing too, because that's not a real friend. That, that's, that, that your decision to quit drinking just move forward in your favor. So the absolute best way to do this is to start talking about this because if you hide it, if you're holding it alone, if you're going through this alone, I've tried, it is painful, you can do it, but not, but not in the long run. You can do this alone in the short term, but it's painful, it is lonely. And why would you want to? There's so many other badass people who are moving forward in life without alcohol. It can be a lot of fun. In fact, it has to be fun because the departure from an addiction has to involve joy, laughter, unconditional self-love and compassion. Because most of us who grapple with an addiction, self-loathing, uh, it's a pretty big factor in there. So hate to break it to you. If you do quit drinking, you're going to have to love yourself again. And that has to be fun. But the best solution that I found is burning the ships because that eventually that means telling people and i've called this a reverse intervention with your with your spouse because sometimes we have like oh i'm i'm quitting drinking and it's just like this surface level uh bomb that gets dropped and it often gets swept under the rug but what i did 
in May of 2014, I told my mom and my dad and my brother, I mean, they're like, oh yeah, we know you don't drink. I'm like, no guys, this is a real deal. It was a reverse intervention. I made sure it was completely mm -hmm. clear what role alcohol was playing in my life and also my goals of removing alcohol. And then later that year in August, I told my fantasy football league <laughs> mm -hmm. and I thought I would get kicked out of the league and but it didn't happen. They all rallied. They're like, how can we help? We had no idea it was this intense. And there's no coincidence that my sobriety date falls really a couple weeks after with a fantasy football league that was late August. My, my sobriety date is just a couple weeks after I burned the biggest ships, the people that are closest to me mm. in my life. I created that accountability. And then I went even one step further. Aaron, I started a podcast and I didn't do this um, for career directions, for anything else except selfishly, I started this as a tool to hold myself accountable. I didn't care who listened. I didn't think anybody would listen. As long as I stayed alcohol free, it was it was win win. But slowly, Aaron, people started to people started to listen, and I I, I am I'll say like I'm I'm versed in this. But my first several episodes, I wasn't I wasn't very good, and I'm still getting better. But this is the power of being vulnerable. People see that and it inspires others. And now I'm traveling the world doing the podcast. We do sober travel trips. We just had one in Thailand and Cambodia. Um, we do live events. We had to cancel our one in Denver this June for obvious reasons, COVID. But we're, we're putting together incredible retreats and events where sure, there are, it's about ditching alcohol, but it's a hell of a lot more than that. Like I said, this journey takes us within these are almost spiritual experiences that we have, but we share with other people and warning. If you do come to recovery elevator retreat, it might change your life forever in a direction that you, you, you didn't envision. So be careful what you ask for. You know, when you put that energy out and you talk about this in many of your shows, when you put the energy out and you start burning the ships, you, you can't go back on the ship. And I, I love that because when I started to burn the ship, you know, I look back, there were no ships <laughs> and I didn't want to verbalize it because I felt ashamed. And I thought, wait a second, I'm the leader. I'm the leader of a, a, a great chiropractic office. I'm a leader of a family. I'm a leader on my rugby team. I'm a, and I'm like, I'm going to look weak. I'm going to look like I, I failed. And I thought, you know what? I don't give a crap anymore because if I were to dig in their lives, we all have something. And I thought, um, I told my wife, I really didn't, I didn't tell my kids at first, but I said, hon, I'm going to do this. And, and I didn't have the energy. I was afraid of verbalizing it yet. And I remember the one day I put it out on Facebook. It was probably only oh, maybe a month into it. And I said, oh, look, I'm done. And I shared how and why. And I'm like, I don't, whatever they say, they say. And you've shared this on many episodes. They come back and they love you. They don't look at you and say, oh, come on, man. You're let's go. You're a rugby guy. Come on, have a beer. They're like, wow, good for you. That's awesome. Nobody, no, and I had that on Facebook. Nobody ever said anything bad to me that there was nothing negative. So it was very supportive. So if you're having a problem and you think, you know what, maybe I need to move in this direction, start taking action steps. And, and I promise you, like, like Paul said, if you start burning the ships and start talking about it, you can't go back. It's hard. It's maybe you can. It's really hard to go back. Um, what else, Paul? You know, let's say they're burning the ships. They're they're starting, and let's say they're having challenges, and it's it's scary for them. Um, I I don't know what we have here in Pittsburgh, and I, I looked up stats on Pittsburgh. I know there's some community groups, but I looked up some stats, and Pittsburgh drinkers are just like anyone else. Um, I think the beer drinking here is a little bit more prevalent. Um, but they burn the ships. Should they, should they join an, uh, an AA? I told, well, why don't you do this? Talk about your cafe RE. I think that is, I, I personally, I never joined anything. I, I wanted to see one probably cause I was uh, embarrassed. I didn't want to join something and even, you know, be more vulnerable, but I was able to do it on, on my own. Well, not on my own with you, all your podcasts, but what, what about Cafe ERE and the community and other, any other resources you can share? Sure. And I had a gentleman on named Jeff, and he talked about how this can almost be an experiment, a science experiment of sorts as you depart from alcohol. 
it's good that you try as many things as you can and many resources as you can and also hobbies and passions. So part of this with Cafe RE, uh, part of this, I say a big part of it is community. So that's, that's, that's the success that AA puts its hat on. It's, it's a community, right? And then if you want to get further involved and you get a sponsor and be a sponsee and you can go further in the program, but the blanket, uh, the blanket plan behind that it's community and all that stuff is community and being a part of community, which is no different than like your neighborhood, right? And when, if you're in high school, you were on the track team, that's a little mini community. You're in student council. That's a little mini community. You're in PTA. That's a mini community. It's the same thing that we're doing with cafe RE. We've created a mini community and the bonding force with us, the camaraderie behind that is we're a community of people who no longer welcome alcohol in our lives. And we have, we keep our groups at 350 people um, to ensure intimacy. I found out once we get more than that, it's difficult for us to really connect on that level. In fact, there's some science behind that. The human brain is only able to make deep connections with about 150 other human beings. And we found that about half of our members aren't fully active. They're active in their own way, but they just don't post. So we're almost at that law of 150 right there. So we are a community of like-minded individuals who have a bonding force, who want to be the most authentic version of themselves. And we do this by removing alcohol. We very slowly find out who we are by finding out who we aren't. And it's every step where we say, oh, you know what? I'm not the guy who wants to shut down the bars at 2 a.m., and go home to my family drunk. I'm not that guy. So it's through a series of uncovering who we aren't, we eventually uncover the true authentic self. And let me tell you right now, it feels so good to do that. And another thing I recommend is listen to the body. We, we put way too much emphasis on the mind, the thinking brain, the thinking mind is 60 to 70,000 thoughts per day. And most of them science shows are wrong. So if the body is saying, hey, you know what? Let's try yoga. Let's try meditation give it a try. And the thinking mind is going to say, this is stupid. We're just sitting here and breathing. Just say, okay, thinking mind, I trusted you for, I don't know, 30 years with my drinking. Look where it got me. I'm going to, I'm going to put you, you, you can have a seat on this one. I'm going to let the intelligence that built the whole body, the, 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 the heart, the lungs, that part, I'm going to rely on this intelligence for a little bit here and thinking mind, just take a break. I love that. We always talk about our innate and that is that, that inner voice it, it, the inner voice is strong. Our mind can really screw us up. Uh, you know, it takes us the wrong way. Do you think when you were talking about the, the community and the support there, does that fill a void that we're, that we need to feel Phil? Absolutely. It does. And I've done episodes on it, filling the void, filling the void. So when we leave alcohol, right, there's a lot of space created, and oftentimes boredom can be the most difficult thing that people encounter when departing from alcohol is you got to fill up a lot of time and you're going to quickly realize, holy crap, alcohol has taken like 30 hours of my week. And wow. now what do I do? And back to the science experiment, right? Um, I've been sober for I've been away from alcohol over five years and I'm in Colorado right now. I was in Oaxaca, Mexico, and then COVID happened. I was like, oh crap, I gotta, I gotta get back to America. And I'm here at home and I saw a skateboard, I skateboard in high school and I took the skateboard to the skateboard park and oh my gosh, I love it again. I've gone like seven or eight times and my knees are all cut up and bruised, and, <laughs> but I'm having a blast doing it. So sure, there's, there's a void that, that needs to be filled, shall we say. And this void, I haven't found a better way to fill it than community. Uh, because it feels so good. It's this tribe, right? And we, we, as you said earlier, it's like part of me didn't want to quit. So there's also part of you that's pushing away this community, pushing away this tribe. But there's a law in quantum science that what you seek is also seeking you. And once you finally are open to this, you just say, all right, the pain from alcohol, that's enough. I'm ready for whatever's next. And if it's a community, then bring it on. Well, it's going to show up. And that's, that's what's happened to me. That's what's happening to hundreds of people. As soon as they put it out there into the universe, they make the internal declaration, right? You're in, has to mean, has to be made internally first at the cellular level, the field, the field, and it was what Einstein recognized. The field is what instructs the physical matter. So the field has to align to your internal declaration, to your internal declaration. And pretty soon 
all these inner declarations of I'm quitting drinking, I need a community, I need people to show up in my life who also don't quit drinking, all that stuff is going to align. It's going to appear magically, but you actually made it happen on your own. I remember somebody saying, you know, if, if you want a certain car and, you know, you go out and buy some, you know, red sport car, you've never seen any of them on the road, but as soon as you buy one, all of a sudden you see them all over the place. You're, wait, wait a second. I thought I was the only guy. It's like your, your mind wasn't ready to see it. And, and I look at this filling the void. If you don't fill the void with something positive, because once you, once you throw something off your plate, there's, a, there's an emptiness. There's a gap. If you don't fill it up, you're, it's be really easy to jump back in because it, you talked about this earlier, comfort. It's comfort. You, you know that. You know how it feels. You know what to expect. Even if it's bad, you, like a bad relationship, you know what to expect. It's the unknown, and you jump back. So to, to get in the community, that's where it, w- it was funny. The, the, I filled the void with listen, <laughs> listening to episode after episode all day in my car. I didn't listen to anything else. I was able to fill the void to give me enough time to separate. And then I felt like I started to get control. That's just, I'll tell you, your, your work is just amazing. And what you've done is just absolutely incredible. And, and I, I, my prayer is that the, the people, not only in our community in Pittsburgh, but this resonates with others. And it just keeps traveling because this not only changed my life, but it changed my relationship with my wife, my kids, um, and longevity. We want to live a long, healthy, strong life. And that's why I wanted to have you on because alcohol is not going to lead to that. It's going, to, it's going to be more destructive than it is constructive. So before we end with a couple fun questions, any last bits of info that you need to share or you'd like to, to share? Yeah, uh, they got the name of alcohol right. In fact, the, uh, I think it's Arabic. It's alcohol, which means body mind and body eating spirit and we've got it's called spirits even on today you'll drive by a liquor store it says you know wine and spirits right so on a woo-woo level alcohol is a living entity right the it, it has a spirit of its own and what it does when congested ingested on a consistent basis and high doses it will lower your level of consciousness the spirit will actually take over your body mm. um, nobody wants that you know, that was so cool you said that because I always wondered, why does it say spirit? And I always thought, well, when you get drunk, you, these crazy spirits come out of you. But I guess that's pretty much what it is. That's, that's actually stuff. part true. Yeah. Wow. That is cool. All right. So some, some, uh, anything crazy, fun, or exciting in your near future besides skateboarding and ripping up your knees? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm real excited about sober travel in our live events as well as we are so we're putting costa rica back on the table and if you get 20 or 30 this one's probably 45 people is open to you get 45 people who want to ditch the booze and day one and day two we're talking about our most deepest darkest secrets um the the friendships and bonds happen fast these trips are incredible i'm also exploring finding a retreat facility an in-person facility that recovery elevator owns and operates i'm excited about that i'm also excited about letting the unknown solve all the unknown for me right um and kind of relying less on the thinking mind like i said earlier and getting better there's a practice there's a there's a strategy of how to step into the unknown and almost be comfortable being uncomfortable um and for a lot of this stuff i'm just gonna let it happen did you, that's so cool. Did you ever think when you first started this first episode <laughs> that you would be where you are today? No, not at all. Not at all. And I have a feeling, Aaron, five years from now, we could have that same question and see where, where this journey takes me. And it's, it's all just the, the power of being vulnerable and having the courage to, to burn the ships. And I'm not unique in that regard, Aaron. I'm excited to ask you in five years. So Aaron, yeah. did you have any idea? <laughs> you know, probably not. That's why I asked you that because I, I do see, I mean, I've seen, I've listened to your journey and when you started doing these, these trips throughout the world and hearing these interviews, it's just so, so cool. Um, and I really appreciate what you're doing for the, for the, not only your community, the podcast community, the world, you've changed my life. And I, I pray that this continues to change others. And we not only create a healthy Pittsburgh, but we create a healthy, healthier world. So, um, 
Paul Churchill, this is amazing. And we're going to have all Paul's, uh, his um, links and resources on our page. Please, I urge you, go check it out. If you're having struggles, join the Cafe RE. Buy the book, Alcohol is Shit. You go to Amazon, you click, it'll be there in a few days. Well, COVID-19, you may, may be there in a week, but you're still going to get it. And you need to start filling the void with good, positive things. I promise you, nothing bad will come of it. All good stuff. Paul, thank you for joining us today and sharing your life and being vulnerable with the community. Aaron, this is, your podcast is great. You're, you're a great interviewer, and it was fun to be interviewed by you. And I enjoyed it. Thanks for having me. Thank you.